As far as we know, the largest animal to have ever existed is the blue whale. But there are so many contenders that have vied for this title throughout Earth's history, and they all have certain ingredients in common that aid their ability to grow so dang large. Let's get exploring the world of giant creatures. Finding out that the blue whale is the largest animal ever sometimes surprises people. Given that there are so many famously huge creatures from Earth's past, I can absolutely understand being surprised that the largest creature is currently living alongside us. It's probably worth the disclaimer that fossilization is a very rare phenomenon. So there may have been something bigger that just never left any remnants behind. Or maybe it did leave remnants behind and we just haven't found the fossils yet, but you know until we have evidence, right? So how does the blue whale get so big? Well, there are several reasons why some species can get large and others cannot, and we're going to look at a few of the larger reasons today. The first is where they live. Any large organism needs to live in an environment where their weight can be supported. Blue whales live in water, and living in water definitely helps. One could argue that the blue whale technically weighs nothing, while it is what we call neutrally buoyant in the water. But it still has the greatest known mass of any animal, so we call it the, the largest animal to have ever existed. When you live in water, buoyancy reduces a lot of the structural challenges that are created by gravity meaning that the blue whale won't be crushed by its own weight as long as it remains in that water. This has helped a lot of marine species become huge in the past as well. There's the famous megalodon, the giant shark that makes modern sharks look like snacks, but was the megalodon the largest predator in our oceans? The problem here is that sharks are cartilaginous fish, and so the majority of their skeletons are made of cartilage instead of bone, and cartilage has an even lower chance to fossilize, so all that remains of these creatures is their jawbone and teeth, meaning that we can only guess how big these creatures are by comparing the size of the jawbone and teeth to their closest living relatives, the great white shark. Some of these estimates make Megalodon the largest fish and the largest predator on earth ever, but we have better ideas of sizes from a few other species, like marine mammals, and some extinct marine reptiles which also got huge. There's also the Jurassic fish Leedsichthys. While it likely wasn't a predator in the same way we see Megalodon, it probably acted in a similar way to modern whales. Both Leedsichthys and Megalodon were fish that got really really big but they never got as large as mammals like the blue whale, despite also living in this neutrally buoyant environment. And the reason could potentially come down to one limitation. Respiration. Animals, as well as some other organisms, need oxygen to turn nutrients into energy. Fish get oxygen by breathing underwater through a complex structure that works by taking in water through their mouths, extracting the oxygen, and then expelling that water out of their gills. This is where the issue lies. The air contains 210 milliliters of oxygen per liter, while the ocean only contains about 8 milliliters per liter. This of course makes for a huge advantage to animals that breathe through the air instead of breathing through the water. So there's a limiting factor to the size of water breathing fish, and it lies in how they breathe. Compare this to the marine mammals like the blue whale, which swims to the ocean surface in order to breathe from the air, not the water, allowing them to take breaths with far more oxygen. On top of this, blue whales also have large concentrations of myoglobin, which is the oxygen binding molecule. This allows them to store large amounts of oxygen in their muscles. Today, our atmosphere is made up of 21% oxygen, which is that 210 milliliters per liter. During the Cretaceous period, we see levels varying between 25 and 35% oxygen content throughout this 80 million year period. 
The Cretaceous period comes just after the more famous Jurassic period, and despite the Jurassic's fame, the Cretaceous is actually when we find the largest species of dinosaurs thriving. So if we were to bring back any of these species in some kind of uh, theme park, they would likely have their tiny hands far too full, simply struggling to breathe to be a threat to anyone. And it's not just fish that have a bit of trouble growing large because of their respiration systems today. If, like myself, you were a child around in the late 90s to early 2000s, you probably at least heard of a TV series produced by the BBC called Walking with Dinosaurs. But, unless you were an excessively nerdy child like myself, you might not be aware that the BBC actually produced three other series as well, all telling a story of the history of life on Earth. My favourite episode as a kid was one that I found simultaneously awesome and terrifying, from the series Walking with Monsters. This episode explored a time called the Carboniferous before the dinosaurs, a time defined by giant forests and giant bugs. Arthropods, such as insects or arachnids, don't breathe as such because they don't have lungs, but rather they have a complicated and honestly pretty inefficient tracheal system that results in them having, honestly, a much harder time absorbing oxygen than many vertebrates. But during the Carboniferous, the atmosphere had the highest concentration of oxygen that the Earth has ever witnessed, to the point where it's theorized that lightning strikes could cause massive explosions. As you can imagine, insects, which have a hard time breathing, had a frequent field day in this high oxygen environment, and they grew unreasonably large. During this time, you'll find super fun animals like dragonflies the size of eagles and a three meter long millipede. While these are terrifying to think about, they still aren't nearly as big as a lot of the other species in this episode, and that's because they struggle with respiration. But they also struggle with another structural issue. Having their skeleton on the outside. Exoskeletons are not only heavy, but they also can't expand. And this means that as the animal inside the skeleton grows, it needs to shed that exoskeleton and grow a larger one every so often. So if the animal in question is itself extra large, then that means having to spend a lot of time shedding and then growing a huge new skeleton. Doing all of this every so often means the animal will regularly consume a lot of energy. In order to grow, an organism must consume more than it expends, which means food. The blue whale solves this issue in two ways. One is by forming a surprisingly efficient means of travel. Its huge tail is able to propel it at speeds of around 20 kilometers an hour when traveling long distances, and it doesn't expend as much energy as one would guess. Not only does it spend less energy, but they also consume a heck of a lot through their method of feeding, which, as you may know, means swallowing an incredible amount of food in one mouthful. Very efficient. Animals that can eat large amounts of readily available food can take in more energy than they expend, which is why herbivores usually have the capacity to grow larger than carnivores, as carnivores tend to expend more energy to get their food in the first place, and they tend to eat less often due to low rates of hunting success. This doesn't mean that carnivores can't get big though. The Spinosaurus may have been 15-ish meters long, making it probably the largest land predator we know of, depending on how we're measuring of course and whose estimates we're taking, but it could also potentially be the Carcharodontosaurus or the more famous Tyrannosaurus rex. Personally, the Giganotosaurus just ain't for me dude. Also, this is the latest science on what Spinosaurus looks like at the time of making this video. I'm just putting a date on it so people watching this in three months time aren't annoyed when it's changed shape again. No matter which dinosaur is the biggest land predator though, they would all need a lot of energy to power their bodies, and the energy available to animals in the first place is also reliant on another internal body factor. Heat. We call animals that control their own body temperature endothermic, or warm-blooded. This is compared to animals that are ectothermic, or cold-blooded. Ectothermic animals rely on the external environment 
to warm them in order to be able to move. This does mean that many animals and other organisms that can control their own body temperature tend to be less restricted in terms of size, as they are less reliant on their environment in this respect. The internal temperature of an animal needs to be warm so that muscles can contract effectively, and many biochemical reactions that allow for muscle contraction rely on enzymes that are temperature sensitive. I'm sure we can all recall a time when our temperature sensitive enzymes restricted our body's motor ability, am I right? <laughs> or, or just a time when it was cold and you felt like you were moving slower or something. Warm blooded animals include mammals, birds, and probably a lot of dinosaurs, while cold blooded animals include fish, invertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, probably some other dinosaurs, and a bunch of stuff of mist. This is also a contributing factor to why you find larger reptiles and bugs in warmer temperatures, like the tropics. Being such a huge animal can have its benefits in this respect though. Not only is the blue whale a mammal and by definition is warm blooded, but having a huge body size actually means there is a smaller surface area to lose heat through relative to that body size. Bear with me, this involves a brief amount of maths, yep, yeah, yeah, okay, alright. <laughs> As objects get bigger, their volume, or the size of their insides, increases faster than the size of the outside that is holding it all together. As animals lose heat through their skin or their exoskeletons, then being the size of a blue whale means that they actually lose heat slower than many smaller animals compared to body size. On top of this, blue whales are full of a fatty layer called blubber that is designed to retain heat even more, to the point where blue whales are actually 27% blubber on average. By comparison, there is an arguably more important body part that makes up only 1% of a blue whale. It's brain. When it comes to brain power, size doesn't matter, you hear that? Okay? Really though, it's, um, it's actually what the brain is made of more than the overall size. In fact, the brain to body size ratio goes down depending on the size of the creature. Despite having a smaller brain to body size ratio than humans, the blue whale's brain is about four times the size of ours. Even though the brain to body mass thing isn't real, there is still a level of brain power required. Having a complex central nervous system that can control all of the processes of a huge animal tends to be a requirement, otherwise the animal simply shuts down. Many groups of animals have nervous systems that are built in ways that would make expanding the size of their bodies not necessarily impossible, but certainly difficult. The other option to get big is to go the opposite direction, and instead of increasing brain capacity you can just have so few processes acting in your body that you can get away without needing to have a brain at all, like some kind of fungus. So when we're talking about the ingredients required to create the largest organism ever known, don't forget these five things as they are, hey sorry I said the, the largest organism ever known. Can we, can we switch back to the blue whale please? The, huh? This is the largest, what? Where's Oregon? Hold on I have to google something. So the blue whale is the largest animal ever known but large organism needs to live in an environment where their weight can be supported. Animals, as well as some other organisms, need oxygen to turn nutrients into energy. In order to grow, an organism must consume more than it expends. That many animals and other organisms that can control their own body temperature tend to be less restricted in terms of size. Instead of increasing brain capacity, you can just have so few processes acting in your body that you can get away without needing to have a brain at all. Like some kind of fungus. Some kind of fungus. This fungus is called Armillaria ostoyae. There is a single network of Armillaria ostoyae growing in a forest in Oregon that takes up 2,384 acres, or around 10 square kilometers, making it 
as far as we know, the largest organism in the history of Earth. It's like my pa always says, this is a fungal world and we're just living in it. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm Ben the Quasi-Ecologist. Until next time, stay curious friends. Just the oxygen binding molecule, allowing them to storage, st blah, 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 storage large amounts of oxygen.